Hello, Music Appreciation Class. It's Carrie Fridley here with a special lecture about jazz and blues traditions. If you are interested in learning more about jazz and blues traditions, please sign up for Music 112 Intro to Jazz. The Roots of Jazz and Blues. So jazz and blues are American music genres. And so the roots uh, are similar to American roots. Uh, the music came from the West African slaves that were brought here uh, and it incubated over hundreds of years and when jazz came out it's the combination of two cultures uh, the European side of America the descendants of the colonists and then the West African descendants the slaves that the freed slaves and the music that came out around 1910 in New Orleans where there were lots of freed slaves living there um, but we'll get into that so jazz and blues the cultures that influenced American jazz or blues and blues it's the West African slaves and the um, early American music culture it's the combination of the two so let's look at it a little deeper West African music musical traditions um, these traditions kept being passed down secretly into the 18th century in the slave cultures. Uh, sometimes secretly and sometimes out in the open. On Sundays, usually, they would uh, worship and sing and play music, well, mostly sing and do music on their bodies. Call and response, that means a leader calls out something and the group responds back with something, vocal. Vocal inflections, so this means um, you put your personal spin on things. Uh, storytelling techniques, so entertaining, suspense, drama. And then B, 19th century America. Work songs, ring shouts, spirituals. Um, so that's part of the West African musical tradition. So after they came to America and were workers, they had new work songs. Uh, ring shouts are a spiritual song and spirituals are songs about the Bible because they were forced to adapt a new religion so the ring shout is the African tradition and the spirituals are usually stories from the Bible but they're all songs all right so that's the West African traditions the Euro-American vernacular traditions, uh, meaning the English-speaking, European-influenced um, entertainment, minstrelsy. So it's like a variety show, minstrel show, with songs and skits and comedy acts. So these were traveling shows. So there's no radio yet or electricity. 
Uh, and in early America, it took a while before we had opera houses and concert halls and minstrelsy were just like traveling shows, kind of like the circus, uh, but with music, with a piano. All right. Um, music from the Americas. Ragtime, the Americas. I'm not sure what that means. The Americas. Ragtime is taking the marching man music of the 1860s and putting a funky beat to it from West Africa. That's what ragtime is. And jazz came directly out of ragtime. Blues is more of the country songs, uh, more like work songs and ring sh the older style spirituals. Blues uh, sounds more like the country, and jazz sounds more like the city. Jazz was born in New Orleans. And ragtime was popular in New Orleans, so the ragtime player that claims he invented jazz was Jelly Roll Morton. He played ragtime piano in a brothel in New Orleans. And he was uh, could read and write classically. And he claims he invented jazz. So jazz developed right out of ragtime. Musicians blended styles. So the word jazz was coined by a uh, by the press. Someone called it jazz, and the word blues was too. Uh, a writer names it the blues. So the musicians were just playing music what they liked, uh, and it, when they wrote about it in the newspapers. They put it in a category. So jazz and blues would uh, have some blurred lines in the early days. And jazz has a lot of blues in it. So uh, the country blues songs um, come out in jazz. All right. Jazz and Euro-American cultivated music. So, in the early days and to this day, jazz is a kind of a fusion of African style of playing and the Euro-American style of playing. But it'll make more sense as we talk a little more about it and as we listen to it. Let's talk a little more about the blues. The blues has the same roots of jazz. So West African roots and then the rural South roots because that's where the slaves were. So when the slaves were freed after the Civil War, at the end of the Civil War, uh, there were jobs as farm workers in the Mississippi Delta, and that's where uh, a lot of people found work. So the blues is associated most closely with the farming communities of the Mississippi Delta. Now there are other similar communities that have a strong blues tradition and it sounds a little different. There is East Texas blues and there is Piedmont blues 
and that is close to us here in North Carolina. Around Statesville, North Carolina, just not far up the interstate, there's a strong Piedmont blues tradition. There are our famous B Piedmont blues players from Morganton, just over the mountain. And there were probably Piedmont blues musicians all around here that maybe didn't get famous, didn't record. But the tradition was in the farming communities between the mountains and the coast. And so Piedmont Blues is very special to our area. But what most people know of as country blues is the Mississippi Delta, because it's bigger. And there were more people doing it because there were more people in the Mississippi Delta. And at the bottom of the Mississippi Delta is New Orleans. So that is how it influenced jazz. Jazz was born in New Orleans. Heavy blues influence. Okay, so the Civil War is over. We've got work songs that help the field work. And so that's part of where the blues come from. There are elements of folk songs. Poor Euro-Americans in the Southern Appalachia. Okay, that's what, that's us. That's us. <laughs> the Southern Appalachians, the poor Euro-Americans. Uh, influence because those musicians would be hanging out together working together. Um, country rural blues. The music itself, singer with guitar. Solo enterprise. Uh, and people think, oh, the blues is sad. Oh, no, I don't want to listen to sad music. But the blues is about being strong during sad times. And it's about everybody sad sometimes and the power of the human spirit and the power of love. So I would say don't be scared about the blues being sad. Okay, so voice difficulties of everyday life. There's a pattern to it. And this pattern comes out in jazz. Three line stanza. First two identical. Uh, the girl I left me. Lord, I'm feeling so blue. And then you do that another time. The girl I left me. Lord, I'm feeling so blue. And then the, then you resolve it with the third one. Feel so lonely. Don't know what to do. So that's one verse. And then you there's several verses. And the chords... Uh, if you're a guitar player or piano player, you might, this might ring true. You use three chords, one, four, and five. Tonic, the dominant, and the subdominant. So it's a simple chord scheme, a simple poetic structure. Uh, country blues. Blue notes, pitch bending. Now this is the West African influence. You slide the notes. Euro-Americans don't slide the notes. European music doesn't really slide very much. But African music does. Um, so pitch bending. So if you've heard slide guitar, that comes from the blues. You use a uh, pocket knife or a prescription bottle, or uh, you sand off a sawed off end of a bottle, slide it on your finger, and then you bar across the strings. And the guitar is often tuned to open chords for the slide guitar, but that gives you that pitch bending and here I was telling you the standard harmonic progression 
chords one, four, and five, and that's usually the called the twelve bar blues. But exceptions to every rule, there's different forms that are found. But most often the twelve bar blues with the same chord changes at the same time that match that three line stanza. New Orleans Jazz, the birthplace of jazz. A fusion of ragtime with blues and other traditional styles. So before the Civil War, New Orleans was a trading post where slaves were traded from the islands. So there were slaves from Haiti that spoke French. And there's a French community in New Orleans. Um, so there were Caribbean rhythms that influenced this early jazz. Now, in the islands, the slaves were allowed to play their drums. In America, they were not. So that's important. The drums are important. So the American slaves that would find themselves in New Orleans being traded at the square, it's called Congo Square because of the slave trading, while everyone was sitting around to be brought up on the trading platform, they allowed them to play their drums and sing songs. I think it may have been only on Sunday. Uh, and so the American slaves of West African descent would hear their drums. And it was very exciting. And the music, uh, to read descriptions about it, was otherworldly. And so the wealthy Europeans that lived in New Orleans uh, would come out to hear it at Congo Square. And it was supposed to be wild with the um, exotic drumming and the songs coming together and it influenced composers in New Orleans at the time. Uh, they say one of the earliest jazz beats was written by a classical music composer who lived in New Orleans and he wrote a classical piano piece about the music at Congo Square called La Bambo Cher. And it's supposed to have the first jazz beats written it down. It's exciting stuff. So I digressed, but I hope you all found that interesting. So music from Congo Square, pre-Civil War, so while everyone's still slaves, strong underlying pulse, syncopations, polyrhythm. So that is straight out of West Africa. If you listen to West African drumming, strong underlying pulse, syncopations, polyrhythms. The most important part is the polyrhythms because that doesn't exist in classical music yet. No one ever even thought about it very much. But in Africa, it's uh, complicated and developed over centuries. African-derived techniques in melody. And mainly, this is improvisation and feel. So Af West African music was not written down. So it's very much led by the lead drummer 
uh, and memorized and felt in patterns. And when someone were to step out and take the lead, they would improvise, put their own style into it. And so this is the very different from classical music. So rhythmic interjections, vocal glides, percussive vocal sounds, and use of blue notes. So the blue notes are a flattened third and a flattened seventh. So it's minor sounding and it uh, highlights the pentatonic scale, makes things more dreamy. The improvisation created polyphonic texture. And that makes sense because say you have two people singing the same song. If one of them starts doing their own thing, then it's going to mean that two people are singing different things. And that is polyphony. And I think what's fascinating about this is this is what happened at Notre Dame with the monks. Uh, they say that's how polyphony got started in the practice sessions with the monks. They're all supposed to be singing the Cantus Firmus at the same time without changing it because uh, the purity would please God. But the monks couldn't help themselves and they started improvising just a little bit in their practice sessions and they liked it. And that was the beginnings of polyphony. They started writing it in, and they thought this would please God. God is in each person. So, interesting similarities here. All right, so Louis Armstrong. He is considered the ambassador of jazz. When jazz first started happening with Buddy Bolden, he was the first famous jazz trumpeter in New Orleans. It's before recordings. We don't even have any recordings of Buddy Bolden. We just have people that, we have recordings of people talking about hearing him. And people that can play and say, he used to sound like this, and they can imitate it. So Buddy Bolden was the first jazz star, and we can't even hear him. So Louis Armstrong was a little boy on the streets, and he grew up listening to Buddy Bolden. When jazz hits in the teens and 20s, Louis Armstrong is a young man, and he becomes... The ambassador of jazz. He's from New Orleans. Everybody loves the sound, and he is young and the best. He was schooled by the greats, and he takes it out to the world. He goes to New York. First, he goes to Chicago and records there, and then he takes it over to New York City, and he's there for the jazz age, which centered all around New York City, the 1920s. The jazz age, it rocked all around the world. Um, and that's because radio and records get going in the 1920s. It's fascinating, 1929, it all crashes down, stock market crash. And there's still jazz, but it wasn't the worldwide force it was in the 1920s. The jazz age. Asheville is considered a jazz age town. We had a boom in the 20s. So Louis Armstrong, trumpet player, singer, 
the ambassador of jazz, uh, arguably the most influential figure in all of jazz. He lived a long life and played his trumpet up until the 1980s and influenced jazz through his whole life. Brilliant trumpet player, improviser, transformed jazz into a solo art. Scat singing influenced Billie Holiday. And uh, we'll talk about Billie Holiday in a second. The most important force in the development of 20th century jazz. For sure. And I have to say, how can you have 21st century jazz without 20th century jazz? So, I mean, I'm going to say he's the most important because without him, there wouldn't even be the jazz there is. But that's me. I'm kind of a traditionalist. So, scat singing, you may be familiar. It's when, well, when you hear, if, see, I'm terrible at it, but uh, you hear it in the raspy voice, and that's because it's, um, Louis Armstrong had that. It, that was his voice, the rest. It's like, <laughs> it's when the vocalist takes a solo with their voice uh, as if they were a saxophone or something or a trumpet with a growly singing through the trumpet. Um, and Louis Armstrong was the first one to be recorded scat singing. Um and it was said when that record came out, well, he claims the music fell off the chair and he didn't know what the words were for the second verse. <laughs> and so he had to just make something up. And so he just used nonsense syllables um, and sang it that way. like, <laughs> And that was singing. And they said when that record came out, Everybody was so delighted with it. Uh, I think it was uh, 1928 that you would just walk down the street and see somebody and go, scattily bap bap ba doo bow and they would scat back to you. Uh, and it was the fun new thing. And after that, it became fair game in jazz to take a scat solo with your voice. And... Apparently, this influenced Billie Holiday, whose voice I guarantee you've all heard. She has an iconic voice. I think you've probably heard Louis Armstrong's voice, too. He uh, later became more of a singer, and even like just singing pop songs, and this, What a Wonderful World. I see eyes of blue. da 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 that was his song. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. And he, so if you think, hear the man with the gravelly voice singing that, that's Louis Armstrong. In the 1920s and starting in the late teens, there was a movement in New York City called um, the Harlem Renaissance. The there was a movement in Harlem called the Harlem Renaissance. And it's a philosophical movement. Uh, and it was the great thinkers in the African-American community in Harlem got together and said, how can we make a new life? for the African-American community. Um, how can we promote unity and hope for our people? And what they came up with was uh, the best way to reach everyone was through art and poetry. And so there are all these lithographs and screen prints, cheaply produced uh, artistic block prints that are the hallmark of the Harlem Renaissance. And the poet at the forefront of the poetry was Langston Hughes. Now, the music wasn't necessarily part of the plan, but the music 
that accompanied this renaissance was jazz in Harlem. And so here is one of the prints that influenced uh, the aesthetic, the art artistic aesthetic of jazz in Harlem in the 1920s. Uh, which, by the way, sp has spread to the whole world. There is jazz everywhere because of radio and records. It also started during World War I. Early jazz uh, people heard it in Europe because there were musicians starting to play it and they were in the army and they played it. There are a couple of notable band leaders that they say were playing jazz in the teens during World War I. Okay, so painter Romar Bearden captures the spirit of jazz performance in his colorful collage, Empress of the Blues. Now, the Empress of the Blues was Bessie Smith. She sang in the black minstrel shows in the South. And guess where she's from? Chattanooga, Tennessee. Just across the mountains from us. And she was very famous. Uh, in the 20s and 30s. She was a blues singer, started it, but um, she was featured with jazz bands because jazz works with blues. I mean, blues works with jazz. All jazz players have to know how to play the blues. So it's, that's part of the overlap. So that's Bessie Smith there in, the, in this painting. Okay, here we have an etching of the bambula, which was one of the African dances preserved in the slave culture on the islands that people got to experience in Congo Square in New Orleans. So here's a picture of, of a still from some moment in the bambula. And uh, as you remember, that is the name of the classical music composition, Gottschalk. It's the composer. And he wrote the piece for piano called Bambula. And it came from Congo Square. This is the roots of jazz. Drums and singing. Now, the Euro influence comes when the law in 1910 is changed in New Orleans. The Creole people, mixture of black and French. Uh, before 1910, if a Frenchman married a black slave woman he could free buy her freedom and marry her and before 1910 she was considered French and white after 1910 uh, and that's the Creole people the mix of French and black in New Orleans after 1910 the law changed and those people were all considered black people because of segregation, they could not work with white people. They had to, they, and so before segregate, before 1910, these Creole people played in the European orchestras, the American European orchestras, what they call it, Euro-American, the white orchestras. And the black people played in the clubs. After 1910, all these trained orchestral players could, weren't allowed to play in the orchestras anymore, and they were forced to play in the black clubs. But they had 
extensive knowledge of music. And the most important knowledge they had was how to write things down and arrange pieces and capture melodies and save them. And so that is really important to the history of jazz. Uh, you have from the islands, these French speaking slaves, marry white Frenchmen in New Orleans. They bring the African beat into the orchestras. Then they're exiled from the orchestras and they are influencing the, the club music. The music in the red light district, uh, the place where the dancing girls are and where the brothels are, and that is where jazz is born. Fascinating history. This is a picture of Louis Armstrong and Billie Holiday. Now, Billie Holiday uh, became famous in the 1930s. So she was, when she was a little girl in the 1920s, she listened to the early records and sang along with them beside the record player with a cup asking tips. And her favorite person to sing with, with was Bessie Smith. So she learned her craft by singing the blues along with Bessie Smith records. Uh, and so when she was 18 in the 1930s, I don't remember exactly what year, in the early 1930s, she gets discovered by a white promoter who uh, gets her a recording date with a famous jazz player. Uh, and that's when Billie Holiday was discovered. Now, an important note about the, the um, white man who heard her sing, I think she was singing at a diner, um, and was taken by her voice. His name's John Hammond, and his mother was married to one of the Vanderbilts. So that's a little connection to Asheville worth noting. Uh, the Vanderbilts built the Biltmore House. So John Hammond was the son of of a Vanderbilt and he uh, walked away from his family's fortune to be a champion of the Harlem jazz community. They needed help. They needed people to write about jazz. Uh, they needed help connecting musicians with promoters and um, managers and touring companies, and that's what John Hammond did, and he discovered a lot of people. So um, John Hammond is actually responsible for getting Billie Holiday hired on a white act. I think it was 19, it was after 1935, I, let's just say in the late 1930s, with Benny Goodman who was the leading white jazz performer. Before then, it was either white bands or black bands. No integration. White dance clubs or black dance clubs. No dancing together. So uh, when Billie Holiday joined Benny Goodman's tour, um, his manager said, don't do it. It's going to sink your career. People aren't ready to see this. And Benny Goodman, who's the son of immigrants and himself 
a victim of racism. He was Jewish. Um, he said, I'm doing it anyway. It's the right thing to do. So uh, Billy Holiday was a groundbreaking musician and in many respects there are a lot of stories about her and her music where she made a difference. Uh, but I think most importantly is that she was in the first integrated touring jazz act in the late 1930s and that helped um, people be more accepting of integration in the future. Billy Holiday, jazz singer, born 1915, died in 1959. Blue singer known as Lady Day. Her real name was Eleonora Fagan, but her father's name, last name was Holiday, and she loved the movie star Billy Dove, who was one of the first uh, stars of the silver screen. So she chose Billy Holiday. She didn't grow up knowing her father but she knew he was a musician and she saw him play several times um, she's born in Philadelphia grew up in Baltimore her mother was a prostitute they were very poor she had little formal formal education no formal vocal training. Uh, as I said before, she used to sing with the record player in the receiving room at the brothel. Uh, she moved to New York, probably worked as a prostitute. They say this because in her autobiography, she told a lot of lies. <laughs> she made a lot of things up. So it's hard to know what's true and what's not. Um, she sang in clubs in Brooklyn and Harlem. Okay, here's the date I was looking for, 1933 recorded with white clarinetist Benny Goodman. It broke the color barrier. She sang in public with a white orchestra. Boom. And these are very memorable recordings. So we're going to listen to one of them. Billy's Blues follows the blues structure written by Billy Holiday. The chorus is a single statement of a melodic harmonic pattern, one time through the song. The vocal verses, intersection between jazz and blues, because what jazz adds is extensive improvisation, polyrhythms, uh, taking solos, that's part of where uh, jazz is different than blues. So uh, Billy takes it there. This is a picture of Billie Holiday and her signature look was to have a gardenia in her hair. So often you'll see the picture of her with the white gardenias in her hair. So let's listen to 
Billy's Blues. Recorded in 1936. Twelve bar blues, short introduction, six choruses. So that means uh, they go through the song six times. Laid back slow tempo, which is characteristic of the blues. Steady accompaniment, also characteristic of the blues. The vocal choruses are two, three, and six. So on one, four, and five, we'll have some instrumental solos. Now, singers, there are singers that can sing a song, and then there are singers that can control their voice as if they had mastered an instrument like mastering the piano. And that's Billie Holiday. She is very hard to imitate. Uh, it's like magic. Masterful rhythmic flexibility. Jazz embellishments, scoops and dips. The instrumentalists respected her as much as they did uh, Louis Armstrong. The best musicians, her solos, vocal solos, were, could hold up to the best instrumentalists. So on chorus four, we'll hear the clarinet improvisation. Chorus five, the gut bucket trumpet raspy tone quality uh, so I am we're gonna look at what to expect and then uh, we'll listen to the song Billy's Blues by Billy Holiday Recorded in 1936, performed by Billie Holiday singing, Bunny Berrigan on trumpet, Artie Shaw, clarinet, Joe Bushkin, piano, Dick McDonough, guitar, Pete Peterson, bass, Cozy Cole, drums. The genre, 12 bar blues what to listen for in the melody, either the vocal or the instrumental solos, syncopated melodies with pitch inflections, free improvisations. The rhythm slow, laid back. 4-4, four, four, steady accompaniment but the solos will have more complex, improvised, improvised flexible solo lines. The harmony, 12 bar blues, repeated harmonic progressions for each chorus. The one chord, the four chord, back to the one chord, up to the five chord, and then resolve back to the one. The texture, polyphonic with counter melodies against a solo voice or instrument. And that is the West African influence. The form, 12 bar blues. So they go through it. They have an introduction and then they go through the song six times. And that's characteristic of jazz. You play the pattern uh, again and again. And each time you do it, there's maybe a new soloist something improvised uh, that makes it different. And that's like the West African tradition because you, you're feeling it and you're doing a pattern and it frees you up to improvise. The expression, laid back feeling, different moods in the solos, performing forces, Billie Holiday. She's the lead with the vocal 
Uh, and she takes turns with the trumpet, clarinet, piano, guitar, string, bass, and drum. Well, the, uh, the, the leads on the choruses will be the trumpet and the clarinet. Chorus two is a typical blues text. The others are more free. Let's listen to it. Duke Ellington and the swing era. Now after the jazz age came the stock market crash and the Great Depression. And it was better for musicians to uh, form big groups in order to survive. So this is the age of big bands. Um, all the little gigs dried up at the little clubs and um, only the large hotels and ballrooms stayed open. And that's why big bands became popular in the 30s and they would travel around. And one of the most popular big bands was Duke Ellington's band. And he was based in New York in Harlem at the Cotton Club and was famous in the Jazz Age and in the 30s. His band was a popular touring musical ensemble all the way into the 1970s. So big band or swing jazz. The era is the 1930s and 40s. Duke Ellington wrote the music, arranged and composed it. His big band style won wider audiences, black and white audiences. He played in dance clubs and hotel ballrooms. His real name was Edward Kennedy Ellington. He got the nickname Duke as a young boy because he would dress so snazzy and he uh, was very formal and polite and just the nicest fellow and he carried himself very well and he they started calling him the Duke. Born in Washington DC, jazz pianist, composer, arranger, and band leader. He had famous recordings. I'm sure they would be familiar to you when you hear them. Uh, and they're, they were in films at the time, like many of them still are. And he brought jazz art to new heights. He said when he started, uh, people asked him, what is jazz? And he said, jazz is freedom. And in the latter part of his career, he uh, said he just plays his music. And that's how he thinks of it. It's just Duke Ellington's music. It's his creative. And he doesn't think about what or what is not jazz. He just uh, composed what he felt. Duke was a major artistic figure of the Harlem Renaissance. In the 1920s, his first band, the Washingtonians, played in New York jazz clubs. He got the job at the Cotton Club in Harlem as the uh, music director. And he hired all the musicians, all the dancing girls in charge of all the sets. And he uh, really ch uh, helped form the jazz scene in Harlem right in the beginning. Uh, the Cotton Club was the best club to go to. All black review, all black um, musicians and dancers, all white audience. And black people weren't allowed to come in there. So pretty interesting dynamic. So as I said, in the 1930s and 40s, he took it on the road toward America and Europe. Uh, 
there was an a need there was a need for arranged composed music. In 1939, he began collaborating with Billy Strayhorn, his music partner, from 1915 to 1967, and they wrote pieces together. One of the pieces made famous by Duke Ellington is Take the A Train. Billy Strayhorn was the composer and arranger. Arranger means uh, deciding which instruments play what, um, layering textures and tonal groups of instruments. Um, this epitomizes the swing style, so hopefully it makes you want to get up and dance rich orchestral palette and that's what i was talking about the orchestration uh how everything's combined he really was uh, a genius and uh in case we haven't mentioned it before uh, the book and myself ellington was the pianist in his band he led from the piano so the recording features ellington on the piano Here's Duke at the piano. Although some have said that Duke Ellington's true instrument was his band, he was an exceptionally gifted pianist. Looking at Strayhorn's Take the A Train by Duke Ellington, LG 49 is a catalog number, so it would have been the 49th composition. And this was recorded in 1941. 32-bar song from uh, the form is A-A-B-A. -A -A. Three choruses. The piano has the introduction, and there's syncopated chromatic motive. Now a motive is a theme. A syncopated uh, means hitting the offbeat. So um, dancey upbeat rhythm rooted in West African tradition. Chromatic means uses all the notes. Not a simple melody. Chorus one. Saxophones present it. Call and response between the saxophones and the muted trumpet and trombones. Chorus two, muted trumpet, masterful improvisation, bent notes, shakes, glissandos, just like in the early days of jazz. Chorus three, unmuted trumpet solo. See if you can hear a difference. And the coda, which is uh, like an afterthought, a little ending section, signature closing, it says here. Uh, there are two repetitions of the A part and a softer closing with a saxophone riff. What to listen for? Disjunct syncopated themes with call and response exchanges between instruments. Broad quadruple meter 4-4 four, four, at a moderate tempo. Syncopated rhythms, short riffs. Complex advanced harmonies. Chromaticism, several going from one key to another. 32 bar form, animated movement with special jazz effects, big band sound with reed, brass, and percussion sections. Uh, it was called a jazz orchestra. The performing forces, the jazz big band, another word for jazz orchestra. Trumpets, trombones, saxophones, piano, guitar, bass, drums. 
soloists are Duke Ellington on the piano and Ray Nance on the trumpet. Uh, let's look at the first part of this, and then on the next slide, I'm going to put the video. So uh, we have an introduction that goes through the chorus one time, which is A A B A. Here's the theme. Ba, I don't know if I'm right. Keep on. Ba dum bum ba dum. Have you heard that? Do 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 do. Take the A train. All right. So let's go to the next slide and listen to the song. So in the 30s and 40s, there was a movement in jazz towards more chromaticism, more complex melodies, uh, and playing things that are more uh, fast and harder to play rhythmically. And this led some jazz musicians towards bebop. Um, kind of split, which is extreme chromaticism, very fast. Uh, so this is what came next. Some other genres that were happening at the same time that all influenced each other was cool jazz and Latin jazz. So this is, we're getting into the 50s and 60s. Rebellion against big band jazz. Late 1940s bebop or bop word mimics two notes trademark phrase. The bebop came from scat singing. Everybody going bebop, 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 and that's what bebop is. Fast tempos, complex harmonies. The leaders of the bebop movement were Dizzy Gillespie on the trumpet. You maybe have seen him. He puffs his cheeks out, and his trumpet is bent up. His early partner. Charlie Parker on saxophone, and the pianist Thelonious Monk. There's Dizzy Gillespie, a major figure in the development of bebop and modern jazz, playing his custom-made trumpet with a raised bell. So some sub-styles of bebop is cool jazz, west coast jazz, hard bop, and soul jazz. Cool jazz is kind of the laid-back version of bebop. They uh, focused more on tone and played uh, slower, more slowly. And one of the main Inventors of cool jazz is Miles Davis. Laid back style, dense harmonies, lower volume levels, moderate tempos, new lyricism. Principal exponent, Miles Davis trumpet. And I think if you heard Miles Davis playing the trumpet, you would that would be a familiar sound to you too. Uh, he has kind of an airy sound. It's a new sound. And... Uh, many say he brought us to the modern jazz that we hear most today. Now, at the same time, going on on the West Coast, we've got 1950s West Coast jazz. Small group, cool jazz style, mixed timbres, often without piano. Contrapuntal improvisations. Uh, that means you have a melody and then you point counterpoints against that melody. De Brubeck Quartet and the Jerry Mulligan Quartet were famous jazz bands that embody the West Coast jazz style. And in 1930s and 40s, Latin dance music, like the rumba, 
becomes mainstream. Dance rhythms, percussion instruments, the congas, bongos, and cowbells, integral to late 1940s bebop style. Brazilian and Cuban elements occur in later decades. And that is as far as our book takes us into the world of jazz. Uh, again, if you are interested in learning more about jazz, we focus on it for an entire semester, an intro to jazz, which is Music 112 at AB Tech. I hope you enjoyed this lecture. Thanks for watching.